Welcome to A Word Fitly Spoken, a podcast about Jesus, His Word, and our joy in following Him. I'm Amy Spreeman. And I'm Michelle Leslie, and welcome to another What Would You Do episode. Amy, can you believe it's been a whole year since our last What Would You Do episode? I know. Amazing. (laughs) Yeah, we should do it more often. Maybe we will. We should. But if you're a new listener or if you're a longtime listener who has forgotten how all this works, here's the story. There's a reality TV show on ABC called What Would You Do? And I looked it up. It actually still is on TV. Um, I don't know. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't know uh, how I'm missing that, but it's actually still on TV. Uh, The premise of the show is that they set up a sort of a weird or unexpected scenario in a public place. They see how people react, and then they interview some of those people about why they reacted the way they did. For example, they might go into a restaurant and have some some actors playing rude customers to an actress who's playing a waitress, and then they'll see if any of the real customers at nearby tables intervene on behalf of the waitress. So things like that. Yeah. So Michelle and I are going to do the uh, podcast version of that today. And uh, a few weeks back, I think it was, we um, asked some of you listeners to just send in scenarios for the show. And uh, you guys sent in some great ones. So thank you so much. We each selected three of them. uh, What would you do type scenarios to ask each other? But here's the catch. We've kept those scenarios a secret from each other. And so we've both got to give our answers off the cuff. Got to think on our feet a little bit. Um, we're recording this in the morning, and I've got some coffee. I hope it's enough to to help me uh, think on my feet. But <laughs> so, uh, and another thing we like to do is see. Um, you know, you could turn this into a game yourself, yourself if you want to. If you'd like to play along, you can um, listen to the scenario and then hit pause if you're on your phone or uh, at your desktop, and then come up with your answer, and then hit play again to see how we answered. Maybe we've lined up. Maybe we haven't. And you might even like to share your answer with us on our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram page. And of course, you can find all the links uh, at a awordfitlyspoken.life uh, on our show notes for this episode. All right, Michelle, are you ready? I am ready. Give it to me. Okay. Now, this first one, and, and all of mine come from our Facebook page, A Word Fitly Spoken, uh, the podcast page there. Um, and this one, I'm, I'm just going to call her M. It's kind of a personal situation. She didn't ask me to keep it anonymous. So uh, M, this is her question for you, Michelle. If you had an adult daughter who came out on Facebook, that's what this is about. Uh, and this daughter stated that she is now in a relationship with a transgender male. So you decide to text her because you're upset that she didn't come to you first and that you had to find out about this on Facebook. You were blindsided. She stated that she knew we wouldn't recognize her girlfriend as a male. And if we don't affirm her, she will never speak to us again. And we need to do better. Okay, so you got that going on. And then she adds, uh, it's now been two years and she has contact with everyone else in the family, but still refuses to have anything to do with us. Her life has taken such a downward spiral spiral as well. I am still so heartbroken over this. I miss my daughter. I really want to talk to her or just see her. I will not, however, compromise the word of God or my convictions to have contact with her. Okay, Michelle, this is M's question to you. What would you do? Oh, that's such a hard, difficult, terrible situation. Um, yeah. I don't think there's really much that you can do but pray. There's there's not I, I wish I could give you like that silver bullet that or, yeah. let me since this is what can, would you do? Let me let me say what I would do. There there is no like silver bullet that you know there's the right combination of magic words that can change this or the right thing that I can do that can change this. Um so I think you know, I would probably set up an appointment with my pastor for counseling and get his his thoughts and mm. his guidance on this. Yeah. But really, the only thing that you can do when your children have decided to estrange themselves from you for whatever reason is to keep praying. And, you know, if there if there are still lines of communication open that you can uh, or that I would be able to take advantage of, um, I would do that. But some some children just completely cut themselves off, and so I would I would trust in the Lord and I would continue to to pray for that child. So that's what I would do. 
What would you do, Amy? Amen. Oh, yeah, I'd be on my knees praying to Michelle. This is such a hard one. Um, and it sounds like she does have um, communication with other family members. So you can kind of reach out through them. I would think you can just kind of let the family members know, hey, I really, you know, I really want to have a relationship yeah. with my daughter, or I really just want to talk with her. Um, and so through them, you might be able to uh, still extend an olive branch, but she might not be open to it. Right. Um, so, you know, you can you can let her know, e- even if she doesn't answer texts, uh, you could still text her once in a while and say, hey, I will always love you. Uh, you're my daughter. I'm here to talk if you want, honey. I love you and I miss you, that kind of thing. Um, she might be, you, you might never hear back, right? Um, but if you do get a chance uh, to have her listen to you, even through a family member, you could say, you know, I'm in a tough spot. So you've put me in this position because you know, I love the Lord Jesus and I, I live to bring him glory and affirming your choices is something I just can't do. And I know you said you've never, you'd never speak to me again and you haven't, but this is very painful for me. And you're asking me to choose between your choices and my relationship with Jesus. So just kind of make that clear uh, that you, you know, you know that um, I can't abandon my faith, honey. Um, but then, if you have used harsh words, because it sounds like there there might have been a a conversation um, where uh, you know doors were closed. But um, if that's the case, you could say something like, you know, I I probably used some very harsh words with you when I first found out about this, and I'm really sorry about that part of it. But I'd still like to have you in my life because you're my daughter, but please don't ask me to choose. But Michelle, the bottom line is this this girl just needs the truth. She needs the gospel, first and foremost, because she is lost. It's very obvious. Um, And then eventually she needs to hear the truth about gender, uh, sex outside of marriage, that kind of thing. But uh, it probably can't happen all in one uh, meeting or phone right. call. And I, I think that, you know, these are, these are things that have to be handled. I, I love how you said go to your pastor because, uh, he would have some great advice about that. Um, and it may, may take baby steps if at all, if it ever happens. But if she won't do that, then just keep praying. Um, you know, Michelle, you, um, you've heard the, the proverb about um, heaping coals on the heads of your enemies. And she is an enemy of God. Uh, but heaping coals might not mean what you think it means. It, it's uh, by your kindness, you're, you're really not heaping coals to harm her, but rather you're you're being kind to her in prayer and maybe even service someday to melt her heart, because that's what coals do. They melt the hearts of the stubborn. And I, I just think that prayer is one of those things that is so vital. Uh, it, and you may never see it in your lifetime. And I, I'm so sorry, Em that this has happened with your child. Um, one of the worst pains ever. So, ah, yeah. So let's move to the next question. What do you have for me, Michelle? Go gentle on me now. You know, I'm kind of nervous about these things. Okay, absolutely. All right. What would you do if you're attending a countywide prayer event and one of the speakers starts asking God to send down his fire to ignite our passions and also speaking in tongues and calling out for demons to flee. What would you do if you were at this prayer rally and that happened, Amy? I, I would try really hard not to roll my eyeballs to the back of my head, fear, fearing <laughs> that they may never come back. But uh, no, obviously, that's that's not the kind of prayer I would want to participate in. Um, you know, and, and if this is going on and I'm I'm praying, I'm, I'm not going to be praying that. I, I just won't be. Um, if it gets to the point where it gets so out of control, like what you just uh, said, Michelle, I would probably not try not to call attention to myself, but I would probably uh, sneak out. I, I in, in, not in shame, um, but just you know, I, I would just excuse myself and and not be a part of that. I just I don't think I could, and it is not the place to stand up and say, "Hey, you know." <laughs> That that's not how we pray around here, but but it, you, right. you you open yourself up to that kind of thing by going to a community wide, um, ecumenical you know prayer meeting because you're going to get some people who don't pray the way you do and probably pray unbiblically. So uh, no going in if that's the thing, um, you know if if that's what you're expected to do, um, plan plan in an exit strategy if you need to, and and don't participate in uh, any kind of prayer that calls for fire raining down and that kind of thing because. You know, we, but prayer, prayer is us making our petitions to the Lord. And of course, we want him to hear our prayers, but, uh, but we don't want to be praying anything unbiblical. How about you, Michelle? Uh, anything to add to that? 
I completely agree. Well, first of all, like you said, I probably wouldn't attend something yeah, like no. that in the first place because yeah. I already know that something like that is going to be ecumenical. And a lot of the people there, even though they call themselves Christians, are going to be lost. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those so-called pastors leading it are going to be false teachers. Yeah. And Scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 14, and I'm going to excerpt this just a little bit, Okay, but here's what it says. It says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has, has a sanctuary of God with idols? Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. So if we obey scripture in the first place and just don't go to ecumenical events like this, we avoid this dilemma altogether of what do I do when unbiblical stuff starts happening? But let's say I'm a Christian who isn't familiar with that passage yet, and I go to this prayer meeting, and these unbiblical practices start happening. Well, I've got two options. I can stay, not participating in it, but I can stay and endure it and learn something from it, or I can leave. Now, Amy, I'm a lot like you. I don't know if I could stand staying in that. I, I just get this almost physical reaction when I'm around something like that. Yeah. It just... It makes my skin crawl. It makes me uncomfortable. It makes me angry. And so I, I've gotten to the point where I would, I've would i seen enough of this stuff that there's not a whole lot more I need to learn from stuff like this. Um, so I would probably just leave because I'm not going to change anything, like you said. And mm -hmm. it's a waste of my time. Yeah. But if I could, I might stay and observe what's going on. You know, if I've never experienced something like this before or, you know, if I don't... Um, Maybe I have a, a friend or a relative who's involved in this kind of so-called church, and I could stay and kind of be exposed to what this person believes, you know, an example of what this person believes, and and learn something from that. Um, so if, you know, if I'm ever maybe witnessing to someone or discipling someone who goes to or comes out of that kind of church, I have a frame of reference for what they have experienced. And it's also good discernment home, you know, watch what's going on and then go home and compare what you saw to rightly handled scripture and then crystallize your thoughts and positions on why those things are or aren't biblical. I would, you know, you could use it to build a clear understanding from scripture why I believe what I believe. Mm, yeah. But typically... Yeah, typically I would obey scripture and not go to something like that in the first place unless I'm unless I'm doing it for some sort of research purpose. You know, Justin Peters has said he's been to like I think 18 Benny Hinn crusades and he's been to Joel Osteen's quote unquote church yeah. and he's been to see Joyce Meyer and all. If you're going for research purposes and you're a uh, someone who is discerning yourself and you're not going to be swayed by something like this, that is a legitimate purpose to be there for. But, you, you know, I just I can't go and participate in something like that. So it's either go and observe or leave. <laughs> so I think that's what I would do. You know, um, I, I love that answer, Michelle. And, and it, it just reminds me of a, a story from quite a few years ago when I was still at the radio station doing a discernment talk show. And uh, Justin Peters was uh, somebody that I was interviewing uh, because he had this little viral video that came out when he went to, I think it was Todd White's church. I can't remember, but uh, but there was some, some really wacky stuff going on and and he was pro this this false teacher was prophesying and and uh he said anybody have a word from the lord and um i as, as i recall <laughs> Justin stands up. He's got his, you know, crutches and everything. Uh, mm -hmm. And he stands up and in his beautiful Southern drawl, he says, I have a word. And yeah. all eyes are on him. And he, he proceeds to talk about the scriptures, about false teaching and, and rebuked the false teacher. It was, it was fantastic, phenomenal. Um, just absolutely loved that. So, yeah. So, yeah. He's, he's great. <laughs> he so is. great. All right. Are you ready for your next one? Yes, Amy, hit me with that next question. Okay, this one is from, I, I think she pronounces her name Sarah, 
And it's actually a two-parter uh, that she put here. It's, it's a scenario uh, on the job. So you're working in a secular workplace. All right. You've just started a new post. Yeah. What would you do, Michelle? You, you've just started a new post in the health services industry, and you are introduced to your new boss, Stephen, who you've just learned has transitioned from female to male. Would you call your new boss Stephen, and what pronouns would you use? Okay, that's part one. I might as well just go with part two because you might be able to wrap these yeah, together. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, part two, same same scenario. And the very first day, you are asked to take minutes for a meeting. You are aware that one of the attendees that you know from a previous role is now transgender and has changed their name to, let's say, Jacqueline Smith, a female, instead of Jack Smith, a male, and their appearance has changed considerably too. Would you add their name to the minutes as Jacqueline Smith to the uh, list of uh, attendees on the minutes? All right, Michelle, what would you do? What would I do? Okay, I actually, I've got an article about this and we will hook it up, link it up in the show notes. Um, But uh, okay, what would I do? First scenario, one of the things we have to remember when we're dealing with um, one of these transgender situations is that when you're talking to someone one-on-one, you're using first person pronouns, using you, I, Mm -hmm. me, you, that kind of thing. Um, so there's not and and the uh, gendered pronouns are second person or even third person pronouns. That's those are the the thing, the pronouns that you use when you're talking about someone to someone else. So, you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't go up to someone and say he you would say you. So um, I think I think what I would do is just avoid calling this person by a name. And if at all possible, you know. Um, hey, my friend, how are you doing today? Uh, uh, hey, boss, you know, here's uh-huh. here's the paperwork that you wanted or something like that. Yeah. Um, so that's that's what I would try to do. I would probably uh, also look in, look, uh, go to go to um, what do they call that personnel? They don't call it personnel. HR. Anymore. Yeah. Human resources. Yeah. Human resources. I would go to human resources and maybe. Just generically ask about the policies regarding um, religious exemptions for for everything in my mm-hmm. workplace. You know, not make it specific to anything, but just you know, I'd like I'd like to read the policy on that and what my options are should something like this ever arise, uh, and just see what what the company has to say about that. Because at some point, I might want to go into HR and and say. Um, I'm uncomfortable with this, that, or the other, and I'd like to claim a religious exemption on that. Um, The second scenario where you're taking notes, if it's a situation of of, of Jack Jack to Jacqueline or something like that, if there's a possibility that you could abbreviate the name, like Mm J-A-C period, something like that, maybe, (laughs) um, maybe I would, I would try to do that. Um, uh, I don't know that I would be really comfortable with that. To me, that kind of situation where you're doing something as a function of your job and the the rules of your workplace spell out that you have to, you know, address this person as Jacqueline. It's not quite the same thing to me as where you have personal choice of whether you call this person by the female name or the male name. Yeah. Um, it's, um, I think Todd Friel has, has given this example sometimes when, when, um, college students have said, you know, I'm in this science class and I'm taking this test and they're requiring me to say that the earth is millions of years old or billions Mm -hmm. of years old, whatever it is. Am I being unbiblical by giving the answer that I'm required to give to pass the test? And he has said, no, because they are testing you on what they have taught you. Yes. And yeah. and so it's not, you're not forsaking your faith. Now, some people might feel uncomfortable doing that. I probably would too. But to me, it's a situation like that. Mm-hmm. Now, um, in addition to, to my answers to both of those scenarios, I would probably begin looking for a new job yeah. or at least a, maybe a lateral shift in that 
uh, business where I could work somewhere else or I don't know. I think I would just try to get out of that situation because the thing is your company is allowing this yep. and your company is um, supporting this. And it's probably not going to be the last time that you're asked to uh, have something to do with this kind of situation. So, um, yeah. yeah, I I think that's I think that's what I would do. What would you do, Amy? Well, that's a great answer. And I actually came from that. Uh, if any of our listeners listen to our uh, off the cuff, I believe we called it uh, what I did this summer. Um, and you know about my my resignation from my uh, secular job. Um, yeah, that uh, that's something that um, a, a scenario when you're working in that DEI environment and, and many companies, especially nonprofits, are taking part in those uh, those initiatives and those strategic um, directions there. Um, yeah, you you you're in a tough spot. It's your employment. And uh, sometimes you do have to leave. And it sounds like in this scenario, uh, you're just starting a new job. Hey, if you're starting a new job, you need to upfront find out during the interview about yeah. these things. Um, and you need to, you know, if they are not going to hire you because they know you're a Christian, you're better off. Trust me. <laughs> you know, yeah. you don't you don't want to yeah. hide that fact. So, um, you know, you, it says you've just started a new post in the health services industry. Yeah, those questions about who you're going to be working for. Now, maybe you haven't met your new boss yet. Um, but, uh, you know, one of those things where they kind of foisted on you at the last minute. But nine times out of 10, your your boss will be interviewing you if the, if there's, you know, and, and you will know if that person is, is transitioning or any other thing like that, or if there's a, a question that they are confused about their gender, you would probably be able to figure that out and then choose accordingly. Um, love your answer about the abbreviating, uh, the Jacqueline Smith. Uh, that that was exactly what I was thinking too, Michelle. Uh, Jay Smith is how I would do it. You know, yeah, hey, you've got the excuse of I'm new on the job. If I'm taking minutes now and this is my job, everybody gets a, an abbreviation. Jay Smith, there you go. You yeah, know, there you go. Uh, N Nelson, you know, M Leslie, anything like that. Nobody gets a first name. Uh, and, and you know, to answer this question, I used to say years ago, and you might find this on some of our previous content, you know, um, episodes, um, I used to say, hey, I, I'll call you whatever name you want, but I'm not going to call you a he if you're a she and vice versa. And, and I'm kind of revising that a little bit because calling somebody by their um, their first name implies that you're going along with with their new um, identity and you don't want to do that mm -hmm. so uh, so I'm kind of I'm, I'm as I go along here and I, as I see how uh, the left ha and this whole DEI initiative stuff has has morphed into something it's really hard to dance around that one and, and you like you said Michelle call them you call them you know hey boss that's perfect but um, you know you and yours is a uh, great pronouns when you're, you're when you're interacting one-on-one -on -one, but it's very problematic when um, you know, you know when you ha are forced by a company to lie, and you don't want to do that as a Christian. Yeah. You know, God tells you no, don't yeah. do not lie, and you can even say that. Hey, you know, you you guys are forcing me to lie, and I I can't do that as a Christian. So um, I can either avoid the situation by using that person's name. <laughs> you know, now you now you're again you're forced to use their their made up name. Um, but, but yeah, you're just in a tough, tough spot. Uh, and if, if this is a new job and you haven't figured this out up front and you don't know about the policies, they'll probably make you sign something on your very first day. That's what uh, my old job started to do. You know, just say, Hey, do you agree with these policies? And then you, you know, okay, you can work here now. But, um, yeah, if there's, if there's no straightforward policy and you're going to find yourself in a, a world of pain every day, it's going to be, um, just angst ridden for you because that's going to be your daily life life is how to how do I yeah you know, how can I do this today Lord and and of course you you pray for the people and you know they're they're not uh your enemy they're they're enemies of God of course but um you know you you want to be kind and, and do this gently but yeah try to find a job where you don't have to compromise <laughs> that's my thought you know yeah I I would just add to that you know broadening that uh, that concept out a little bit that Christians may want to start looking, you know, as a whole, looking more to jobs that we can do from home or jobs mm -hmm. that we can do where we don't have um, someone like that over us, you know, where we yeah. may not be in the public sector or we may not be in a a company that is very liberal and and things of this nature. We we want to may want to look to working for a Christian company or a mm -hmm. Christian boss or or just going into business for ourselves, you know, yeah. that, 
that might be a good idea as well. But hopefully with, you know, the the election that has just taken place and some of the policies we're already seeing yeah. President Trump uh, roll out what he wants to do, especially about this particular issue of, of the trans thing, um, you know, hopefully that won't be as as problematic as it is now or as problematic as it could have been mm -hmm. uh, had the election gone a different way. Yeah. So we will pray for that and praise God for that uh, as as we go along. Well, before you ask me my next question, Michelle, um, one thing that we're seeing even before the election is a lot of these big, giant companies that were going completely down the uh, DEI path, like Toyota and John Deere and those kind, uh, have already uh, revised their policies. They they realize that there there's no profit to be made, and uh, they're actually um, you know disengaging half of their customer base. So, so so that's yeah. the good news. But it's still very prevalent in in government agencies, um, nonprofit profit schools, that kind of thing. Um, there, there is one, uh, it's a secular organization, I think, um, but, but there is one job search place called Red Balloon that, uh, does a complete listing of all the non DEI jobs, uh, that, that are out there. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in that, uh, Red Balloon, I think it's redballoon.com. Uh, we can also throw a link in, uh, to the comment section if you like. Right. And and look, our churches can help, too. Look, yeah. if you're looking for a job, ask around at church if, if someone at your church has a business and they're hiring or they know of a, a, you know, a fellow Christian who has a business that could use someone like you. That's what the church is for. So, um, you know, one of the things that the church is for. So, yeah, take advantage of not well, not take advantage of your church family, but <laughs> take advantage of that resource that yeah. that God has provided to you. And uh, and see if you can put yourself in a situation where you're not in this scenario that that Amy just presented. So, uh, alrighty, okay. all right. What's your next one for me? Okay, well, um, actually, continuing this this same um, the same topic here, oh, okay. um, and we did not, you know, Amy and I did not look at at the scenarios beforehand. So it's just a lot of y'all have questions about these these same kind of tough issues. And I, I really wanted to go ahead and ask this question to you, Amy, because of what we were just talking about, okay. um, because it seems like every day we're hearing about more and more companies that are ditching DEI. So I'm, I'm hoping mm. DEI is on its way out and I wanted to get this question in before that happens. So here's the scenario. Okay. You work in the public sector and are required to complete your office's manda mandatory training in DEI regarding a situation mm -hmm. in which somewhat, someone is transitioning from male to female. So this is a, a test. You have, you have to take the training, mm -hmm. then you have to take a test on it. So the test is multiple choice questions, and you answer them as best as your conscience allows. Some of your answers are marked incorrect by the proctor. So your final score is just short of passing but you can retake the test as many times as it takes until you finally pass, okay? So the question is, Amy, would you go back and tweak a couple of your answers so you can pass this mandatory training? What would you do? So so my uh, test scores show that I'm just under the line or right. just slightly over the, okay, under You're the just, line and I'm just not- Just short of passing. Okay. And, and what are the consequences if you don't pass? Do you um, get fired? I wasn't provided with any consequences. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> just that this okay. is mandatory um, training. All right. Just getting some clarification. I, I dislike mandatory training, and I, I got mm -hmm. out of my old job before that uh, had to happen. Mandatory means mandatory, and your job is going to be, uh, depending on that, HR will definitely write you up if uh, if you don't take the test. But it sounds like in this situation, I've already taken the test, and I've provided the best uh, biblically sound answers of out of kindness uh, and being in a secular workplace that I possibly can. Um, you know what? I might go back and tweak some of the answers, not to compromise, but to even and make it more clear where I stand. And to say, you know, if, if I haven't been firm, um, then I would take this opportunity. It's like, yeah, I'll take this test again. Um, as a Christian, <laughs> yes. And I, I would preface everything. Well, as a Christian of, of faith, uh, I know my company doesn't discriminate against people of faith because you've stated that. Uh, and so here's what I'm going to say. You know, here's how I would tweak this answer. And then you go on and do that. And, and in the kindest way possible, you would lay out uh, how you would treat the person who is transitioning and, and how you're not compromised the truth, but that you would continue to do the job that you're required to do to the best of your ability. And if that doesn't yeah. pass muster, 
you know what, just say, well, I've taken the test as best I can. Um, you know, now it's now it's in the, the court to, you know, the ball's in the other court now. So uh, HR and your boss are going to have to figure out what to do with you, right? Um, but yeah, you're not, you're not going to compromise. I'm not going to compromise um, on that. Uh, if, if I, but I would take the test again, just to make it very clear who I am, what I believe, and how I would treat the person. That's my thought on that. And it's unfortunate because, like you said, Michelle, a lot of these companies are, you know, bigger companies are getting away from, um, from the DEI stuff, but, uh, there are still, you know, it, it's going to take a long time for other, uh, government agencies, public sector jobs to, um, to catch up. So. Let, let's pray that that happens soon. What do you think? Yes. <laughs> would you add anything to that? <laughs> well, I would just clarify that this is a multiple choice test that you're taking. So you're not. Oh, I don't have, get to do an you know, essay? No. Oh, in that but, case, well, uh, yeah. See, what I would yeah. do, I would take that multiple choice test and then I would turn the paper over and write what you said on the back. <laughs> <laughs> it, it might be an online thing. Yeah, it might be an online thing where you can't turn a okay. paper over. Um, but I would also um, email and say, "Here, I, I've completed my test. Yeah, and here, here are some notes. You know, here are some side yes. notes to each of these things, uh, if if exactly. that's the case. But again, you're you're going to be the best possible representative of Christ that you're going to be there. And right. if that's Absolutely. unacceptable to them, then they're going to have to fire you and give you a severance, maybe. So. And yeah. you'll be out of a job, but you're but you're doing it for the right reason. You're not doing it to be in their face. You're doing it to glorify God by not compromising. Yeah. So, yeah. Anything to add to that, Michelle? Well, here's what I would do. I mean, this is a really tough situation. And, you know, I'm thinking yeah. about this situation, the one that we just talked about a minute ago, and the one about the... Um, the daughter that has estranged herself from from the mother and these a lot of these situations are situations that we just cannot do anything about you cannot control whether you're going to lose your job or not you know as as far as being a christian and not compromising on uh your values and and what what christ says you know you can't compromise on that you can't compromise in the situation with your daughter and so a lot of these situations that we will get into increasingly in the future are going to be situations where we just have no other recourse but to pray and to trust God. And so, um, so I would, I would keep that in mind. But, um, to be honest, the, the mere fact that my company is forcing me to take this training and that they're basically testing me over and over again until I'm forced to say what they want me to say to keep my job, just the idea mm -hmm. of, of all of that would have me looking for a new job. It's, it's basically right. brainwashing is what they're attempting here. And um, as a Christian, I, I can't go for that. So the fact that my company thinks this kind of thing is appropriate, I'd want to get out of there as fast as possible. However, if there were another option available to me, like a religious exemption or even mm -hmm. possibly an appropriate lawsuit against the company for forcing this on me, I would strongly consider it not just not just to save my own job, but also to set a precedent and to push back against these companies that are trying to force Christians to bow to this satanic religion, because that's what it is. Ultimately, if you yeah. look at it from a spiritual warfare perspective, this is just Satan using his captives to try to advance his kingdom in this world. So I would really consider if, you know, like Queen Esther, God had brought me to this company and to this issue for such a time as this. It would it would take a lot yeah. of prayer, definitely conversations with your husband, you know, and certainly submit to whatever he would want you to do if you're if you're married, but I would I would take all of that in, into consideration. So mm. All right, yeah, Amy. that's great. Okay, I am ready for my last question. Okay, this one is uh, from someone who asked to remain anonymous, so I won't mention her name. And she just writes, here's a scenario for what would you do consideration. All right, Michelle, you are hosting a ladies gathering in your home to craft and chat with other believing women from your church. During the course of conversation, one of the ladies, let's say it's a deacon's wife, mentions attending a yoga class at her job. Now, you don't want to embarrass her in front of others, but the others at different stages of their walk with Christ also need to hear the truth about yoga not being appropriate for Christians. And she says, I have some concerns about yoga. Uh, it's, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, so Michelle, what would you do? These, these ladies are in your home. You have a chance to speak up. 
Well, that's a situation that really requires a lot of wisdom. There are some situations like that where you can sort of say something very gentle, not directly to the person, but there might be some sort of comment that you could make that would help others to see that this is not a biblical thing to do. But you you have to be really good at that kind of thing, and you have to have a lot of wisdom to know exactly what to say and exactly how to say it. So for the most part, I I am not that kind of person. <laughs> I'm the kind of person who hears something like that, and the image I get in my mind is you know, a child sitting in the street with a truck bearing down on her. And you just yeah. go, no, you know, come <laughs> here, you know, want to grab her out of the street. Um, so, I mean, that is the 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 knee jerk reaction that I have. And I have to learn how to calm down about that. You know, this mm, this yeah. person is this person has been doing yoga all these weeks and, you know, it's not going to hurt one more day if I wait and talk to her privately. So I I the Lord is so working on me about this. And I <laughs> humbly admit to everyone that I have not arrived yet. Um, but so I think that's what I would do is, is, is pull her aside and just very kindly. Um, first of all, make sure you heard right, you know, that she actually is participating in yoga and not that you thought she said she was participating in it, but that, yeah. you know, she's just, she just mentioned it or something like that. So make that because that's, you know, I have trouble with that, too, is making sure I heard right. And so I would do that first. And then I would say, you know, that it really concerns me that that you're mm -hmm. doing this and be very kind and very gentle because this lady yeah. probably just does not know. That's something we need to remember, something I also need to remember um, when we talk to people about these things. Most Christian women, evangelical women just don't know that this stuff is ungodly. If it's if it's popular, if other Christians are doing it, if it claims to be Christian, they think it is. And you know, discernment is just not being taught. These these things about why yoga and all these other things are are evil and unbiblical, it's not being taught. And yeah. so they just don't know. And um so I would I would take that attitude with her and just be very kind and very gentle and uh, and come at it from the perspective of I know you're a Christian and as Christians we we want to do what's godly and I know that if I were doing something ungodly that I would want someone to gently come and tell me and in, in love that this thing I'm doing is it doesn't line up with scripture and I I just thought you might want some more information on that um, so that you can. You can make a wise, biblical, informed decision about participating in yoga. Would it be okay yes. if I send you some some email you some information? I've got some a few links that uh, talk about why why yoga is unbiblical, and then hopefully she won't get too upset. And you know, you can say that you you can just look at it in your own time. You don't have to answer back to me if you don't want to. Just it's something to consider. And uh, hopefully, you know, you can send her one or two. And that's another thing. When you send her, when I send her the information, I want to be sure not to overwhelm her with 5,000 yeah. links. <laughs> just, I, I would probably just send her maybe two or at the most three uh, good mm -hmm. videos and articles about why and short too, not not like a four hour video on why <laughs> yoga is wrong, but because people don't have attention spans these days either. I don't either. If somebody sends me a four hour video on something, I am very unlikely to watch it no matter what the yeah. subject of it is. So, um, so I think that's what I would do. And then, then just pray for her and, uh, and, and ask the Lord to open her eyes. I mean, that's that's what has to happen in all of these discernment situations, is that the Lord has to open the eyes of the person and give her that gift of discernment to be able to see what is wrong and, and to work through supernaturally through his word to convince her of what is what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad, what is biblical, what is not. Um and yeah, I think I think that's pretty much the extent of what I would do. What would you do, Amy? Well, I, I like how you said that the Lord is still working on you and on how you would react because I think that's everybody's first inclination in the flesh. We want to, we want to protect people, right? We want to say no and, and make sure that people aren't falling, uh, into, into these habits that, um, 
actually lead you away from Christ and into something else is, is the worst case scenario. And uh, and we know you know, you and I have both written about yoga extensively, and uh, we we know that yoga is so much more than just stretching, which is kind of the first thing people go to. It's like, well, it's just stretching. You know, how harmful is it? But it's actually a religious practice of Hinduism. So um, there are other just stretches you can do without uh, calling it yoga or you know going to a yoga class. Which uh, you know these yoga classes, um, these teachers that come in, the, one of the first things they'll say as you're unrolling your mat is, you know, Namaste, everybody, and and that means um, I, I bow to the God in you. If you didn't know what that was, um, and you're supposed to say it back, meaning you bow to the God in them. So yeah, there, there's a lot more that can be said, and um, but I, I really like also that you're, you're praying for wisdom in that moment because this is in your home, and you know you have to be able to ask God for wisdom in in reading the room. Do I say something now? Do I take her aside later? Um, and so, you know, it's going to be different for different um, home situations like that. Um, I, I think in this scenario, people are at different stages of their walk with Christ. So I'm assuming that there may be one or two discerning people in the room who might also uh, speak up at that point and, uh, or look to you, you know, their eyeballs are on you. Is, is she going to say anything? You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because if she doesn't, I'm going to, you know, so, um, and, and then there's newer Christians too, who you know, might not know anything about this either. Um, so another thing, you know, I, I love your answer about taking her aside and, and biblically counseling her on this, you know, discipling her on yoga, and then following up later to make sure that you say, you know, I, I sent you some things on yoga. Did you get a chance to look at this? What do you think? Um, you know, are, are you, uh, how, how are you feeling about this kind of thing? And then, you know, expand your friendship and, and continue to pray for her and that kind of thing. Um, if you do choose to say something in the moment, um, you might want to take a very soft approach considering that there are different ladies in the room at different stages in their walk with Christ. So uh, you may say something like, you know, I, I do have some concerns about yoga, but I this isn't the time or place to talk about that, you know, depending on if it is the time or place and say, you know, I've got some uh, some articles that um, explain a little bit more about my concerns and then ask their permission. Is it okay if I share that with you guys? Uh, maybe I can do a group text or something. If you're not interested, that's fine. Um, but but I, I just wanted to speak up and and just let you know that there are some red flags about yoga. And and that might inspire people to say, yeah, I want to know more about this. So, uh, so then now you have an opportunity to to uh, email. I, I like how you said, yeah, don't send me a four hour video. In fact, uh, for me, <laughs> I I don't like videos. People send me videos all the time. It's like, oh, I, I can't. I don't have time in my day to watch all these um, articles. Yes, I do. So that's just my personal way of uh, consuming um, discernment type things. So anyway, that that's my thought on it. <laughs> Anything cool. to add? No, I don't think so. I think I think okay. we covered that pretty well. I think I think we got, hit all the hit all the uh, high points and all of that. It's it's a difficult situation. It so, is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. I are you ready for your last question? I'm ready. Okay. This one this one should probably be easy for you, being a dog okay. lover. All right. You've got yeah. This is a this is a sort of a light lighter hearted question. Okay. You've got a new puppy. You've got a new puppy and she's good at barking, especially when you uh, leave her in the crate alone. You're yeah. trying to address the barking with all the training resources that you've learned with past pets. Your neighbor, however, texts you that the puppy is barking all the time and it's very disruptive. You apologize, assure the neighbor that you're working on it and ask mm -hmm. if she has any suggestions to help, but she says no. You continue to work on it and notice there have been improvements, but the neighbor reports you to the Humane Society and threatens to call the <laughs> landlord. What would you do, Amy? Oh, boy, those puppies, they can be so much trouble, can't they? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember. I remember all the puppy days. Um yeah, I, I would continue talking with this lady. The worst thing you can do is ignore. And, and there's so many proverbs about that too. You know, just, just don't let that, don't let that wall come up. Make sure you're uh, continuing to address it with her. It's like, oh, it's getting better, I hope. But, um, if there's a way to muffle the sound and it, it sounds like you're leaving the puppy alone in a crate, um, wouldn't do that. If you are, you know, concerned that you have to be away maybe for an hour to go shopping or something like that. Uh, yeah, the, the crate is a good thing. 
thing if you can soundproof the room and just say, you know what, I'm going to soundproof the room today, neighbor, and uh, uh, see if this helps. But um, we're getting there and we're slowly improving. So um, thanks for thanks for understanding kind of thing. You know, and, and you don't know if this neighbor is saved or not. Uh, person's calling the Humane uh, Association or Humane Society or, or any other authority. Now you've got another problem. Now you have to explain to them that you've got a puppy that's barking. And they do that when they're left alone. They they cry and they whine. Um, and, and the other thing, you know, that I would think of is um, if you're leaving the puppy alone all day and you're going to work at a job for hours on end, you shouldn't have a puppy. You know, somebody needs to be there to be with the pep puppy. It's just like, you know, it, and I don't mean to compare it to having an infant because obviously you're never going to do this. So, but you know, if you did that with a, a child, um, that would be horrible and, and CPS should be called. But you, you don't leave a puppy alone all day. And unfortunately, that's what happened with, with my current dog, Tucker, as uh, the previous owners left the dog in the crate at four months old and the dog cried and whined and, you know, it didn't cause a problem with the neighbors, but that's just not fair to the dog, the animal. And so um, when when you have a puppy, be prepared to take care of the puppy. You are a responsible pet owner and continue to, you know, seek out ways to um, make sure that puppy grows up with discipline and, um, and doesn't have any of the bad ha- habits that would uh, cause neighbors to complain. So um, I, I guess that's my answer and just continue to pray for the situation. But uh, I, yeah, what, what do you think, Michelle? What would you do with this puppy? And this neighbor. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I have I have a loved one who's going through this exact scenario oh, almost uh. verbatim. As a matter of fact, I, when I first saw it, I thought that she was the one who had written in with the, the <laughs> question. But um, I I know this is a difficult situation. You yeah. you love that precious little puppy, but as a Christian, you're called to love your neighbor too. So yes. how can you do both at the same time? So let me preface this answer. I know we probably have a lot of dog lovers out there in um, in our audience, but let me preface this answer by saying that I know there are a variety of of right ways that this could be worked out because to a great degree, this is an issue of Christian liberty. I mean, it's not sinful to have a dog. It's not technically sinful to put it in a crate. Uh, it's not sinful for the dog to bark, you know, so there are a number <laughs> of biblical ways that that these things could be worked out. But the name of the show is what would you do, not what should everybody else do. So I'm, I'm right. just going to say personally <laughs> what what I personally would do in this situation. Okay. <clears throat> And I'm going to answer similarly to what you said and also to the question about the prayer rally earlier. This scenario says that the neighbor can hear the dog barking when it's inside and that she's threatened to call the landlord. So I'm going to infer from that information that I'm living in an apartment. Um, I would not get a dog if I were living in an apartment, just like you said, Mm -hmm. Amy. Um, When my husband and I got married, we lived in a townhome. And even though it had a fenced yard, which was, you know, about the size of my living room rug right now, but a fenced yard nonetheless, we still didn't have a dog because dogs are animals and animals need to have space to run and be free and not be cooped up all the time. And additionally, like you said, we were we were both working full time at that time and the dog would not have gotten the attention that it needed. But if I were already in the situation of having a dog in an apartment, I think I would explore all of the options available to me. I would watch all the dog training videos on YouTube and see if there's maybe something I've overlooked in my training. Um, I would consider taking the dog to a doggy daycare business or mm, an obedience yes. school until I got it trained. Um so they they do have those doggy daycare. It's expensive, but you're the it one is. who bought the dog, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, yeah. So those are some options. Or maybe there's a friend or a relative with a fenced yard who doesn't live too far away who would be willing to have the dog come over occasionally until you get it trained. And that's the option that my loved one chose. Huh, okay. Um You know, maybe you could get a neighbor kid who needs to earn a little money to come sit with the dog when you have to be gone. You know, Mm -hmm. that that might not be feasible if you're leaving the dog all day in the crate while you're at work. But if it's just a situation where the dog only cries, you know, when you're gone to the store, like for an hour, like you said, that might be Mm -hmm. something that could be done. Uh I might be able to move to another an, another apartment that's adjacent to empty apartments or one that's 
closer to other tenants with dogs who would be more understanding. Or maybe I could go ahead and move into a house or a more pet friendly building or something like that. I would think outside the crate, so to speak, and see if there was a way to keep the dog, get it trained and keep my neighbor happy in the meantime. No. But if if none of those things were possible and the neighbor was still unhappy and threatening to call the landlord, I would make the hard decision to rehome the dog. I mean, as a Christian, even a bothersome neighbor is more important than your dog. And you have to love your neighbor more than you love your dog. Your right to have a dog does not supersede her right to not have to listen to your dog bark. And your dog continuing to annoy her, like Amy said, it's, it's not going to open up any doors to share the gospel with her, show her the love of Christ, or give her a favorable opinion of Christians. And, you know, it's also not worth the hassle of getting in trouble with your landlord and potentially getting evicted. And honestly, I like Amy said, I, I feel like this is worth mentioning again. I just feel really sorry for animals who are caged or kept indoors most of the yeah. time. God created them for the outdoors. They need to have the freedom to go to the bathroom when they need to, to run around and bark and roll in the grass and chase squirrels and dig and all of that. So that's what I would do. I would try to work something out. But if I couldn't, I got to love my human neighbor made in the image of God more than my dog. So that's that would be yeah. my bottom line on that. I love that answer, Michelle. That is so perfect. I like your answer better than mine. So uh, it's good that we have these shows because we can hear what other people would do and kind of say, you know what, I, I can I can revise. So yeah, that, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, I think it also shows us the how how when you just have to answer off the cuff. That's different than when you get to sit and mm -hmm. think things through for a while, that maybe you have a more complete answer. Because yeah. I always feel the same way when when you say what you would do, because you've had time to think about it and write it out and all of that. I always right. think, oh, that's such a much better answer. I, you know, I, if I had had time to think it through, maybe mm -hmm. I would have come up with some of that stuff too. So I think this, what, what would you do is, is a good, is good for that as well to show us the importance of not making decisions just on the fly like that, but really sitting down and thinking things through. Amen. Hey, before we close out, can I throw in a bonus question from somebody? Yeah, yeah, let's do. Okay. All right. This one's a super easy one for you, Michelle. I know that you think about this all the time. Uh, and I've thought about this too. Um, the, the lady writes, I currently attend a biblically sound church, but the distance and my work schedule make it hard, if not impossible, most times to make any events to meet people and be involved in the church family. Michelle, what would you do? Oh, goodness. Um, that I've been in that situation yeah. before. Yeah, it's a tough situation <laughs> to be in, but it is. church is so important that it is important yeah. that we be somewhere where we can be where we can be a faithful, invested member of a doctrinally sound local church. And you know, people, I hate to say this, but it is worth moving over. I don't, I don't hate to say that, but it's it's a huge thing. Um, moving is so huge that if you can find something sem semi close to where you live, you know, you might have to, you might have to drive for a couple of hours and you can't move. And so that's just the way things are and the way things are going to have to be. You can try inviting people over to your house for fellowship. I don't know that a lot of people would uh, be too keen on driving a couple hours to go to a fellowship and then have to drive a couple hours home. But you can try doing those kinds of things. You can try, um, you know, extending yourself a little more to to go to fellowships after church and things of this nature. Um, but <clears throat> I, I would I would probably try to find something that's closer to my house. And, and uh, I have a a good resource for that on my blog. It's my church. Yes. Blog. We'll put that in the show notes for you. Uh, it's it's at michellelesley.com and the tab in the blue menu bar is called um, Searching for a New Church. And lots and lots and lots of uh, church search engines on there. Recommend Recommendations uh, from my readers of, of good churches that they know of. And hopefully I would be able to find a good church that's closer to home. But if I can't, I would, here's what I would do. I would either move closer to that church and, and that's important. I mean, people, people think, well, that's just, you know, that's ridiculous to, 
pick up yeah. and move just to be closer to a church. But think about it. You pick up and move for a job. You pick up and move right. to be closer to your grandchildren. You pick up and move to go to a university. You know, there are all kinds of reasons that are less important than being a being a faithful member of a doctrinally sound local church that we move for all the time. So I, I, in the past, that's the main thing I have encouraged people to do is to move. However, you don't want to move for a church, get there, be in the church for six months, and then the church goes apostate. So what I'm encouraging people to do now, and this is, this is what I would do now, is if you find one of two things, if you have found that doctrinally sound church two hours away, make an appointment with the pastor, go in and talk to him at, about church planting. You know, if you're if you need a good church in your mm-hmm, area, yeah. lots of people in your area need a good church. And so that's right. that's the best thing to do is is because most churches are planted by other churches and just go in and start a conversation with him about church uh, planting a church in your area. You don't, a lot of times when I bring up church planting, women are like, oh no, I've got to start a church myself. You know, this is such a huge (laughs) thing. It it can sound overwhelming, but that's not what it is. You, you go and talk to someone who is equipped and knowledgeable and better able to handle this than you and go, I need a church. What can we do about this? Can you help me? You know, point me in the right direction. If the pastor of that church just flat out says no or comes to the conclusion that they're not able to do it or whatever, also on that link that I just mentioned on my blog, I've got some church planting organizations that, you know, you can contact and ask, just like I said, present your story to them and say, what can I do? Can you point me in the right direction? Could you send somebody to plant a church? Could you you know, is maybe there's a church in my area that I haven't heard of that's a church plant that is just getting started and they don't have a website or anything yet. And and you could point me to that church in my area. So so that's what I would do in, in that kind of situation. What would you do? Excellent wisdom, Michelle. I love that. And I was hoping that you would mention your church finder. I knew you would. Um, and I actually used that myself many years ago uh, to find the church uh, that uh, that I was going to at the time. Um, excellent, biblically sound church. Uh, exactly, you know, perfect for that neighborhood. However, I lived quite a distance away and uh, didn't think that there was anything closer. And so I realized that uh, as I was driving to a woman's Bible study and I was trapped on a bridge in the middle of a terrible snowstorm. Mm. It's like, what am I doing? I'm endangering my safety here. <laughs> and so uh, so we we thankfully found a church closer to us. And it, it was small and it was kind of off the radar, uh, but but they do exist. And I love the, the all of the resources that you have on your church finder, Michelle. Um, the other thing I just wanted to ask about in this, um, in this scenario, uh, she said not only the distance, but her work schedule made it hard, if not impossible. And we really want to consider, and I, I don't know if that means that uh, the work schedule precludes her from actually going to a Sunday service if she's working on a Sunday. I would consider changing your work schedule or your job for a church that you can make sure that you're there um, if that's the case. I, I don't know if that was the case in this scenario, but but ladies, if you're facing that and, and you find yourself um, unable to attend church services because of uh, a work schedule, uh, you need to be able to go to your biblically sound church and be a part of that fellowship and that yeah. body of Christ. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and 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 I would say, and church is more important than your job. I know that's a radical thing to say, but you're but fellowshipping with God's people, like He has commanded you to do in Scripture in Hebrews ten twenty four through twenty five, is more important than your job. And look. Ask the Lord to give you a new job if if that's the case. If if your job is keeping you from church, ask the Lord to provide a way. Maybe you can change your schedule. Maybe you can get a different job in that company that doesn't require you to work on Sundays. Maybe you could get a different job. Who knows? But the Lord delights to answer the prayers of his people who want to be obedient to him. So ask him, tell him you want to obey him, but you just you need him to provide a way for it. And and he, I, you know, I'm I, I believe that he will. I believe that he will provide that way for you, some kind of way. Now, you have to be willing to do whatever it is he provides for you, <laughs> but uh, but God delights yeah. to answer those kinds of prayers. And don't don't discount prayer 
because that's what he wants us to do. He may have put you in this situation and brought to you the realization that you need to be in church as a, you know, a, a way of growing you and growing your dependence on him and, and getting you to cry out to him for another job. And, and so you can see his work in your life. So right. yeah, be sure you're in prayer about that. That's what Amen. I would do too. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's going to wrap things up for this episode of What Would You Do? What did you think, listeners? Let us know how you would have answered on the post for this episode at our Facebook, Instagram, or X pages. And you can find the direct links to all of our social media pages, like Amy said at the beginning, at our website, a awordfitlyspoken.life. Yes, we hope you visit often. And you know, while you're at our website, consider clicking the support tab and helping us to defray the costs of podcasting, which I'm I'm finding, Michelle, are, are continually increasing every year. So thank you so much to all of you who have donated through PayPal and Patreon. And a special shout out today to uh, Cynthia for her recent very generous donation. Thanks for supporting us, Cynthia, and all of you who do. We really appreciate you for doing that. Uh, also, don't forget to check out all our other resources including the speaking tab where you can find out how to book Michelle and me to speak at your next women's event. We'd love to come. We sure would. And until next time, what should you do? Find the answers to all of life's questions in the Bible and walk worthy. 